I'm Rabbi Ami Hirsch of the Stephen Wise Free Synagogue in New York, and you're listening to In These Times. Ken Burns is a master storyteller, the best-known documentary filmmaker in the world. His 35 films on subjects like baseball, jazz, Mark Twain, Benjamin Franklin, the Statue of Liberty, the Civil War, and now the U.S. and the Holocaust are, at their heart, love letters to America. A patriot in the truest sense, Ken sees our country not for what it is, but for what it could be. And so he lays bare our greatest failures in the hope that next time we'll do better. Ken, it's an honor to have you. I've watched many, many of your documentaries. You're a hero of mine, and not just mine, but for many Americans. So thank you for taking the time to speak with me today, and welcome to In These Times. Oh, it's entirely my honor. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to our conversation. I'd like to focus, of course, on your recent documentary about America and the Holocaust. Beforehand, if you could just give our uh, listeners a brief biographical history, uh, what brought you to want to do documentaries in the first place? You, you, You do them so spectacularly well. Did you study that? Did you always want to be a filmmaker? My mother had cancer when I was a little boy and died just short of my 12th birthday when I was 11. Afterwards, my father had a fairly strict curfew, which he forgave even on school nights to take me to or have me watch on television movies. And I saw my father cry for the first time, not at my mother's long, long, long debilitating illness, not at her death, not at her funeral. And it was not lost on me and others that that was the case. And When I saw him cry at an old movie at age 12, several months after my mom had died, right then and there, I vowed to be a filmmaker. That's what I wanted to do. At that point, it meant being a feature filmmaker, going to Hollywood, whatever that meant. But I went to Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts, a brand new experimental school for college. And I came the second year of its existence in 71. And it rearranged all of my molecules. I got to study with two extraordinary teachers, Elaine Mays and my mentor, Jerome Liebling. And they reminded me quite correctly that there is as much drama in what is and what was as anything of the human imagination. So I abandoned the sort of the Hollywood idea and got involved in documentaries, and then realized that I had this completely untrained and untutored interest in American history, and that that's what I was going to end up doing. You consider yourself a historian? You know, the simple and the glib way is to tell you that I'm a storyteller. That's what filmmakers are. I'm interested in telling a story, and fortunately, history, and I've chosen almost exclusively to work in American history, is mostly made up of the word story, plus high, which is a good way to to begin a story. It's the laws of storytelling are what are interested to me, but it doesn't mean that we have not been unmindful from the very first film that PBS broadcast called Brooklyn Bridge, right up to the most recent, the U.S. and the Holocaust, particularly that one, of the scholarship involved. Rather than be window dressing or people that appear on camera, they're people that work with us, like Deborah Lipstadt or Rebecca Erbelding, Daniel Green, many others throughout the process, from the very earliest conception and treatments to scripts to then beginning of editing at various stages and editing and right up just to broadcast. Many documentary films are, and understandably and honorably so, about advocacy. And we're really about telling a story. And a story is essentially, once it's done, it's not my story anymore. It's your story. And the writer Richard Powers says that the best arguments in the world won't change a single person's point of view. The only thing that can do that is a good story. So whether it changes you at the edges or fundamentally at the core, that's really in some ways up to you. And, and up to how it's received in you. I tell you, as a recipient of this story, as a reader or watcher of this story, the stories you tell, to me, it seems like you have a love affair with the United States, that this is sort of a love story to the United States and on behalf of the United States, because so many of your documentaries are about baseball and jazz and Mark Twain and, of course, the amazing documentary on the Civil War Even that, it seemed to me, it came out of a place of such deep love and affection and respect for America and what its ideals are and what it could be if it applied itself. That's exactly right. I'm so happy that you said that. You know, sometimes people ask me, besides the United States, what unites the film? I just say love. 
I just think that's really the currency of the universe. And it's too often forgotten in the kind of binary traps and ruts we find ourselves in all the time. You know, Lincoln, in his address to Congress in in December of 1862, what we now call the State of the Union, talked about the United States as being the last best hope of Earth. And that has helped reinforce an idea of an exceptionalism that we either have or we don't have. I see this more as a potentiality. If you're going to be exceptional, it's a constant process of working on oneself. That's true of the individual. That's true of the family. That's true of the community, the congregation, whatever it might be. It's true of the country as well. And so I think particularly in times of stress, as we're in right now, in which the fabric of that society and the continuity of the abiding ideas seems severely challenged, it's really important to remind ourselves of the stories that we share in common. And these are complicated stories. I think part of the problem is that we have been fed a kind of sanitized, superficial Madison Avenue view of our history. And some of it's really wrong and upside down. The post-Civil War period known as Reconstruction comes to us as this bad period in which it turns out the losers wrote the history and that a homegrown Al-Qaeda or ISIS, the Ku Klux Klan, are the heroes in both the two great popular films about that period, The Birth of a Nation and Gone with the Wind. And it's the exact opposite. And diving into that and understanding how important it is to un- to get nuance, to get complication. I-, I have in my editing room for all to see a little neon sign in lowercase cursive that says it's complicated. There's not a filmmaker on earth who wants to change a scene if it's working, but We're constantly doing that as new information erodes the confidence of one version and requires us to adopt or figure out how to adopt a much more complex view of of the story we're telling. That's super important. I mean, there's a very oft-repeated cliche that history repeats itself. It has never, ever repeated itself, ever. Sometimes we say you're condemned to repeat what you don't remember, and the motivation for that is a really important part, but that's it's actually not true. Uh, Mark Twain is supposed to have said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And if he did, then he's getting closer to the truth. But I think it's Ecclesiastes, the Old Testament, that gets it right. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There's nothing new under the sun, which suggests that human nature doesn't change and that human nature superimposes itself in the same measures of greed and generosity, purience and puritanism, you know, the marvelous and the miserable in equal ways over the seemingly random chaos of events. I say seemingly because most of us don't perceive a pattern that others who take the time might see. And so we begin to hear echoes and rhymes and recurring motifs and themes. We tend to sort of shovel together as repeating, but but we don't. What we have to be remember is that human nature is the same, and people had conversations like ours 10,000 years ago. I so completely agree with that. I, of course, try to study human nature. That is what the religious enterprise really is about. It's about getting to the core. Of who, why, why we're here. What's our purpose here on earth? How do we wish to be remembered? You know, which, what do we wish to leave? And all of these are hugely, profoundly existential questions that the world's great religions have attempted to answer in one way, shape, or the form and, and seem to have answered them in almost exactly the same way. Yeah. It's almost like we were uh, taught in rabbinical school, you know, when you're preaching, you're not necessarily trying to persuade or even to say, look at me and behave like me. You're almost just allowing people to listen into your internal struggles. It's like constant struggle to climb out of the swamp. That's essentially what the human enterprise is about. You know, every morning at dawn, I have for the last eight years been reading a quote from Leo Tolstoy's last book called The Calendar of Wisdom, in which he assembled essentially spiritual religious advice for each day of the year. Some of it, a small fraction of it is perhaps anachronistic, but most of it just still rings true as these truths have done for millennia. I think in many ways, art shares a similar purpose. It was Tolstoy himself who said that art is the transfer of emotion from one person to another. And while your sermons are not supposed to, you know, do this or make people be this way, they're sharing in your struggle. And the truth and the ultimate um, 
veracity of that struggle as it appears to the other is a measure of how effective you will be. And so I think it's the case in art as well, that the authentic application of techniques which artists have is what essentially draws us to somebody and permits that transfer of emotion to another person. And maybe it's a minor thing, as I'm suggesting at storytelling. Maybe it's huge and profoundly life-changing. One passage in the uh, documentary that you made on the Civil War actually changed my life. I quote that letter from Sullivan Ballou all the time. I do it privately. I do it publicly. And that's the thing with your documentaries. You're able to approach big issues, cataclysmic, world-changing historical issues through the lens of a particular person or a small group of people, the kind of thing that the watcher, the listener, recipient of the story can really identify with and understand. You used to talk about six million Jews killed. That's hard to really convey. But if you look at a picture and you say two of these three people are no longer alive, that's a whole different way. That's precisely it. That's it. And what's happened is the phrase six million has become so opaque that you just hammer on the outside looking for something. Daniel Mendelssohn, the writer, studied six of his relatives, his great uncle Schmiel Jaeger and his wife and their four daughters to find out the particularities, as he called it, of their demise. Only one in a gas chamber. All the rest are killed in horrible, horrible ways, mostly in the show by bullets, but in other places. But but to understand and take the onus of the word six million, we said nine million Jews in Europe in 1933 when Hitler came to power, when the Second World War came to an end in 1945, two out of three had been killed. And we happened to be looking at some footage of a young woman looking out a window, happy and content, a Jewish woman and her parents or friends or whatever lean in two of them for a second and lean out. And you begin to realize the fragility of all of this. That's where I think we, we have to be careful as, as filmmakers. The Sullivan Ballou letter that you talk about is, is a love letter, but it's a love letter at so many levels that it's really important to understand the totality of it. It is a love of government. It is a love of country. It is a love of cause. It is a love of wife. It is a love of lover. It is a love of family. It is a love of God. It is a love of children. It is so many things in it that you begin to realize that you can communicate these big things. You know, you want the top-down history, which is the way we're normally told, to be met by something bottom-up that that kind of proves it, if you will. That's important to understand that the architecture of the atom and the solar system share a profound design and that it's important that our stories be located not just in the broader dynamics of from the mountaintop, but down in the valley in which the lives are, are lived out. The struggles are daily painfully felt. Can you tell us what brought you to want to do a documentary about the Holocaust and America's role in the Holocaust. Yeah. So we made a film that came out in 2000. The we is, of course, Sarah Botstein and Lynn Novick. Lynn Novick and I were the co-directors of a film in 2007 called The War, about the Second World War. It was written by Jeffrey C. Ward. And afterwards, we were approached often and very surprisingly by people who had a, a whole bunch of questions. And a lot of it was animated by some misinformation, perhaps even some disinformation that presumes some things about Franklin Roosevelt or presumes some things about America or presume this or presume that. And we realized that even though we'd had a quite, I think, beautiful and difficult section on the Holocaust in that film, that people were were laboring to answer some of these questions, however they had inherited them. Seven years later, Jeff Ward and I, without Sarah or Lynn, made a film on the Roosevelts with a much smaller scene on the Holocaust, but no less provocative in terms of these questions and assumptions and presumptions that people were making, many of them fraudulent. We realized how much we didn't know. And the next year, 2015, we were approached by the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., and they're in the early stages of planning an exhibition called Americans and the Holocaust and wondered if we were interested in something that would be the same subject. We you know, wouldn't crawl, crawl each other. We'd, we'd work in, in association. And that's what happened. We were in no way tied to each other. We shared scholars. We, we interviewed those scholars that were involved with it, particularly Daniel Green, Rebecca Erbelding, many other people who served that exhibition and that 
extraordinary institution, that museum, helped us behind the scenes in immeasurable ways, identifying archives, identifying survivors. And so we set off to do this, and we realized going in that we were going to have to tell a very difficult story about where America was coming from, because we like to tell ourselves comforting myths, not just about the greatest country on earth, but about a nation of immigrants. And that is true, but also at the same time, not true. Opening and tolerant of all religions, true at times and horribly not true at other times. And so we needed to sort of set a table about what was going on in the United States, the anti-immigration sentiment, the anti-Semitism that was rife, the fact that Hitler himself had grown up admiring the Americans' extermination, as he put it, and then isolation of native populations, that how he would then later come and send jurists to study the Jim Crow laws in southern states to model the mid-30s discriminatory Nuremberg laws against Jews that were in some cases a little bit less restrictive in some southern states, one drop of Negro blood, as they called it in those statutes, constituted being a black person. But Jews were defined by Jews of a first order and a second order, and then a couple of mongrel orders by the time you got to the purebred Aryan. And then you found a lot of people echoing things we hear today about Jews, about we shall not be replaced by these immigrant hordes. And we passed a very restrictive immigration law in 1924 that set quotas and made it impossible for the United States government, even if it was disposed to do so. And in many cases, we find in the State Department, you know, implacable anti-Semites there at the gates. Having said that, the United States is not responsible for the Holocaust. We let in more people, 225,000, than any other sovereign nation. But my feeling is we could have let in five times as many, maybe 10 times as many. You're talking about subtracting 2 million from our horrible 6 million figure, and that's a big deal. And we could have, and we didn't do it. So there's a lot of stuff on us. We didn't just discover all of this when the concentration camps were liberated in the spring of 45. There were 3,000 articles about the mistreatment of Jews in 1933 alone in American newspapers. So we needed to sort of say, you know, this is a much more complicated story. As we move chronologically through this horrific story, you begin to realize that sometimes, as people say over and over again, a piece of paper is the difference between life and death, a piece of paper that gets you out of a country, the piece of paper that gets you on a boat, a piece of paper that gets you into a country. The ideas, though, bad and good, don't require a passport to travel. And so they manifest themselves, our own preoccupation for decades, both not only among conservatives, but among progressives. There was a big story to tell, and it seemed important for us to sit in front of it. You know, and and we lead off the film. The prologue is of Otto Frank. Now, now most kids today's introduction to the Holocaust is through Anne Frank, which is an amazingly beautiful diary, but isn't about the Holocaust. And it's only been recently discovered, and why the film represents that new scholarship, and why we put it at the front is that for years, Otto Frank, who checked every box of appropriateness for coming to the United States. He was well-to-do. He had contacts in the United States. He was not going to be a charge, a ward of the state. He would be able to fend for himself. Could not get in. I'd like to imagine if we had been a better country at that point, we'd been our better angels, that maybe Anne Frank would still be alive. I've said this over and over again. It's been misunderstood. I said, I won't work on a more important film. I don't mean it's the most important film I've ever done. I just won't work and haven't worked on a more important film in terms of its subject matter. This is an important story for humankind. And the final thing, as we were working on it, we began it in 2015, entirely different kind of United States then. And then as we we worked on it, we began to realize that, that the rhymes were just accelerating. It was just uncomfortably rhyming. And so where we thought we'd conveniently end the film in 1965 when LBJ and Emanuel Seller, who had been a freshman congressman trying to stop the Johnson-Reed Immigration Act of 1924, is in his swan song and, and he helps a new immigration law that's imperfect, but a lot better than the pernicious quota systems of the Johnson-Reed Act. But we couldn't. We had to go up to the present right now to understand. ADL, you know better than I do, has recorded more anti-Semitic incidents in the last year than at any time in their history since they've been recording them. And I've had people come up to me terrified, people who survived 
and who are terrified that this is happening all over again. And I am I'm outraged by the idea that people who have gone through the Holocaust and who have survived it and have come to the United States, have established families, who have raised children, who have just added immeasurably to the goodness of our country, should at this moment be fearful again. What would you say, now you've looked at this from a historical perspective as well as from a storyteller's perspective, what is the central message of America and the Holocaust, from your point of view, what is it that we should be taking away? I think that we didn't do enough, that we could have done more in this moment of great challenge, in this moment of real importance, an exceptional country, which I think we are, but at that point, we're not behaving like one. We had the opportunity to save human beings more than we did, and we did not do it. Having said that, you know, FDR authorized the creation of the War Refugee Board that did more than just about any other organization in saving human lives, mainly in Romania. Tens and tens of thousands of lives were saved. But in a little bit, I want more. You know, it's like I, I don't want my baseball hero to hit 225. I want him or her to hit 300 or more. Why do you think we didn't do more? We could have taken in, as you say, many more millions of people, and the country wouldn't have been worse off. In fact, in the long run, it would have been better off. We got so much better. There was enough room here. There were enough jobs here. Why do you think we didn't do it? It's the fear of the other. It's the rampant anti-Semitism, but also racism and just xenophobia of the time. And I think it combines, there's no excuse, but the depression challenged everybody fundamentally in a way that it was able to be exploited by some politicians that were particularly anti-Semitic. And people in public life like Henry Ford and Charles Lindbergh, that this would just, you know, take away. Yeah, as Charles Lindbergh said, some Jews add a little bit to a culture, but too many the way New York has is you stop listening after a while because you go, you cannot believe a human being is saying that. It's really baffling, right? Because the country has such enlightened founding ideals and has such high aspirations for itself and to some degree has a very high self-image of itself. But at the same time, there was always this very powerful nativist streak in the United States and in American society. In fact, the original America first was, you know, the, the type that didn't want to get involved in the war, didn't want Jews. Lindbergh was part of that to me and to the, much of the Jewish community to see this slogan, America first, bandied about decades after the war. Of all the slogans that they could have come up with, to come up with this slogan seemed to me, on the one hand, really distressing. But on the other hand, it said a lot about America because these fundamental personality streaks in American society, they were always there and they're still there. Well, if we believe Ecclesiastes, they're everywhere, and all the better impulses are. And you can go back. I'm now working on a film about the American Revolution, and it's pretty amazing. You're absolutely right about the extraordinary sort of concentration of intelligence and virtue at that time. But the guy who wrote our catechism, the guy who wrote the second sentence of the Declaration, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, he owned hundreds of human beings and didn't see the contradiction or the hypocrisy. And so what you have is always, as you know, from your daily work, is people kind of hoisted on the petard of their own hypocrisy and at the same time trying to somehow outgrow that hypocrisy at the same time. It's what makes stories so interesting. You know, people complain to me when I'm out speaking about how there are no more heroes anymore. And I just have to say, time out. You know, the Greeks invented an aspect of what we think of heroism, and they endowed the gods with all of these important lessons. So Achilles has his heel and his hubris to go along with his great strengths. And what they're trying to tell you is things that then show up in other religious tradition, pride comes before a fall. Nobody is perfect and that we all have to understand our own unique blend and then be careful about how we attack the other because it's so simplistic to get into these binary kind of things, red state, blue state, good, bad, Christian, Gentile, Jewish, Muslim, gay, straight, whatever it is, rich, poor, north, south, east, we do it all the time. We do it without thinking and we're always othering somebody. 
Jews, by the way, have been the easiest others for millennia. And, you know, if you don't have a country until the late 1940s, it's tougher that way. I think that the importance of this story is that it's all about othering. You pointed out that you felt that one of the central messages of the film and the American role in, the, uh, in World War II and its relationship with the Holocaust is that we failed on a certain level. We failed to bring in the numbers of people we could have brought in. Do you ascribe that failure throughout all the uh, departments of government, including the head of the government? You know, FDR was considered during the war, but especially after the war, as almost like a idol-like figure for the American Jewish community. There were people still alive decades later who refused to countenance any word of criticism against FDR. They considered him almost like a redeemer. Do you also ascribe to FDR some of this failure? Well, of course. I think it's not categorical. He can be that redeemer. I mean, he first of all appointed more Jews to his government than anybody else had in the past. His secretary of the treasury was his good friend, dear friend, Morgenthau from upstate New York. His wife was harping at him daily about what was right. He's also a master politician. He knows the Congress has voted overwhelmingly for this Johnson Reed Act. He can't let the people of the St. Louis Inn that have just been turned away from Havana. There's not a law that permits him. He's not a king. He's not a fuhrer. He's not a dictator. He could have been impeached had he said, we're going to let these people in. So he had to work between it. And it appears to us, and right now, one's own politics right now helps define how you see FDR, right? I try to remind people that we've gone to the best scholarship. When he seems insensitive in our film and not doing enough, you feel it. And at other times, you begin to understand what he's going up against. There's a historian, Peter Hayes, in the film who says really important stuff that when there's a proposal to let in 10,000 Jewish kids a year in 39 and 40, just the kids, right? Not their parents, God forbid, right? That it's overwhelmingly turned, it's actually, its sponsors pulls it out because they're afraid that other people will actually shut down all immigration altogether. Roosevelt already knows all of this stuff. Meanwhile, he's trying to end the neutrality acts. Now, whether we brought in 10,000 or 20,000 Jewish children mimicking the kinder transport in Great Britain or not, if he had not gotten the Neutrality Acts revoked, we might all be speaking German, right? I mean, there are some things that politicians do that look at first blush like it. And then I, there are things that in retrospect, we love to appoint a villain. Wouldn't it be great to find a villain almost as bad as what was going on over there, over here. And you just can't pin it on Roosevelt. He's too good. And he's also at many points, and the film points it out, not so good. What's worse is Breckenridge Long and a few other people in the State Department who are changing the rules, moving the goalposts, you know, raising the bar, whatever your metaphor is for that, and making it impossible to bring in more Jews. And because they're anti-Semitic. There's another young guy at Treasury named John Paley, who has to get an exception, he creates the War Refugee Board, to this idea that up until this point you cannot spend U.S. funds in a war district. And so he says, this is ridiculous. We can save people's lives. And that's why the War Refugee Board is created. And when State Department slow walks it, FDR gets on the case, and it's not. So is he perfect? Absolutely not. Is he the villain of this piece? Absolutely not. You have some segments in your film about Rabbi Wise, Stephen Wise. I'm the rabbi of the synagogue that he created in the early 20th century. First, let me ask you about President Roosevelt. He insisted, including in his meetings with Rabbi Wise, he insisted the best thing that America can do for the Jews is to win the war as quickly as possible. And that justified, at least in retrospect, not bombing the train tracks that led to Auschwitz and the concentration camps. Do you believe that he really believed that and that did he have another option? Was it his opinion or the opinion of his military advisors or others not to bomb the tracks, not to do more? So so I, it's a very complex question, as you know, Rabbi. This gets to the heart of the matter. If we'd let in more people, we'd brought in more people, then more people could have gone to those places where they could get out, whether it's you know Casablanca or Marrakesh or it's Spain or Portugal, wherever it is that you're going to get out. 
But he's also absolutely right. He has to win the war. That's what he has to do. And one of the reasons he knows he's right about that is because he knows how anti-Semitic people are. I mean, after Kristallnacht, 86% of American Protestants, 85% of American Catholics, and 25% of American Jews didn't want to let anyone in, even after we found out what happened in Kristallnacht. So you find an American Jewish committee in which at one point Rabbi Wise is considered progressive, right? As opposed to more conservative Jews who are cautioning, let's not do anything. Let's not make Hitler matter because if he gets matter, and in fact, you know, when Herschel Grinspun, a young Polish stateless person, shoots a minor, kills them in Paris, that's the pretext for Kristallnacht right? We're going to take it out on the Jews. You did this to us. When American dock workers a couple of years earlier take down the Nazi flag from the Bremen, Hitler makes it the official flag of Germany. So you have many American Jews saying, let's not do this. Don't do the boycott. Don't do the marches. Don't do this. Wise is saying, no, we cannot not act. Later on, Peter Bergson comes in and says, Wise is a timid, timorous person, American of Jewish persuasion, not a real member of the Jewish tribe, right? So you got within a Jewish community many different points of view. And this is the disservice everybody always does to the other, right? Is to say, all Jews are this way, or all this are this way, or all this is that. There is as many kind of opinions and ideas about it as there are human beings. And so there's really complex, nuanced storytelling that we're compelled to do. And then I just think in our own hearts, individually, regardless of whether we're making a film or we're just thinking about it, we have to understand the exigencies that each family, each individual has certain pressures and certain needs and certain requirements. And these things change too. People's views migrate and evolve or devolve. And so somehow you've got to take all of that into account. I mean, to me, the stunning polling is after the war, after it's out there, when now you've got pictures of ovens and you've got emaciated people and dead people stacked like cordwood and stuff we wouldn't even show in the film because we didn't want to re-victimize the people of, you know, bulldozers with shovels of human bodies. Only 5% of Americans wanted to let in more people. Only 5%. Now, let me ask you about the Jewish community. You mentioned Peter Bergson. Even historians who think that the Jewish community could have done much more, that Rabbi Wise himself could have done much more. He had a personal relationship with President Roosevelt. Did you have a chance to look into that more deeply, and do you have an opinion on that? I do have thoughts. We did look at it very deeply, but I think at some point we've crossed over the line into Monday morning quarterbacking, right? Right. What we need to do is acknowledge what happened and why it happened and just say, as we say, never again. Ascribing blame or the lack of action or too much action or those sorts of things are ways in which we do a disservice to the lives of the people. I'd rather sit there and say, what symphonies weren't written? What children weren't raised with love? What gardens weren't tended beautifully. That's what we're missing. This is the amputated limb that we feel long afterwards. And we know who's to blame for it. We know who's to blame for it. And I think it's always important for any community to be self-reflective and to be self-critical. But I think that that is how you go forward, not how you settle scores in the past. I'm for trying to get it down to tell the story of what happened, and then we can continue to have conversations. I can just tell you This is what happened, and you know right now, scarily enough, has a lot of features that are very much like it. So Deborah Lipstadt said in the film, the time to stop a genocide is before it happens, to which I add in all humility, given her extraordinary position at an ambassador level working on anti-Semitism, the time to save a democracy is before it's lost. And a lot of times we spend a lot of time with the games, the parlor games of what if or who was and was it this person's fault or whatever. We know whose fault it was. We know exactly whose fault it was. And that country has held themselves to an account much better than what we've done. We've seen ourselves as the liberator, the greatest generation. We've gone on. We've wiped our hands about it. So let's tell a more accurate story, which was what we tried to do. And then let's go forward to make sure that the same toxicity that was present in the United States then and is still present now 
doesn't in some ways affect the lives of the human beings in the United States and in the world in a detrimental way. And that's just leaving a kinder, more thoughtful path, living out a truer and realer and more meaningful life. So that was going to be my last question. Is there a final message that you can summarize for us that will guide us in terms of what we do today and tomorrow from your learning and understanding and documenting of this part of American history? Our survivor, Guy Stern, who's over 100 now, who ends the film, says it the very, very best, that that we have no ability to stop its recurrence, but if we know exactly what happened, we can offer the facts of what happened as a way to sort of keep that from happening again. And this is a variation repeated and by me in this conversation, this wonderful conversation with you, Rabbi, of never again. You just have to say it. You have to say it and you have to repeat it and you have to mean it. And you can't blame somebody else as you're saying it. It's our own. We own this as human beings, all of us, Jews and Gentiles, everybody. We own this. This is something that's happened in the lives of human beings on this planet. And we own it. This is considered, as he's, as Guy Stern says, the nadir of civilization. I want to thank you for taking the time. You're a brilliant documentarian and a storyteller, and you're a beautiful human being. Thank you. I, I just have to say that it's co-directed by Lynn Novick and Sarah Botstein. It was written by Jeff Ward. They make me look good. <laughs> Send them our congratulations as well. Thank you, sir. I now have a better idea why Ken Burns is such an exceptional documentary filmmaker. Having a brilliant mind helps, but it's not only that. Ken has a discerning heart. He is a student of human nature and is exquisitely sensitive to its potential and pitfalls. For me, this is the key point. He started our discussion with a verse from Ecclesiastes. What was is what will be. What has occurred is what will occur. There is nothing new under the sun. That is the starting point of history, because fundamentally, history is the account of all the possibilities of human behavior, and human nature has not changed since Ecclesiastes first uttered those words some 3,000 years ago. Our technological progress is miraculous, but as Ken indicated, we have the same conversations as our ancestors of yesteryear, the same fears, the same dreads, the same hopes, dreams, and aspirations. It is why we are drawn to ancient myths and legends. We recognize ourselves in them. As such, history cannot simply be a mechanical recitation of what happened. Rather, it is the philosophy of what happened. When we document history, we document human nature in all its glory and deficiencies. We search for the idea, the human pattern, that resides in every event. The reason that we do not seem to learn from history The reason that we appear to make the same mistakes over and over again is that these are not the same mistakes. History never precisely repeats itself. No two events are identical. History teaches us the range of human possibilities, the kinds of events that may happen if we act in certain ways. But no future outcome is certain. In science, given the same conditions, we can assume the same outcome every time. But with regard to human affairs, The identical outcome never happens twice. There are too many variables and too many unknowns. Every day is new. We can never replicate the precise conditions of the past. In human affairs, there is no science of the future. It would only be science fiction because the future hasn't happened. And there is a vast number of possibilities. For this reason, we cannot determine with certainty what will happen tomorrow by studying what happened yesterday. First... We are not entirely sure what happened yesterday and why. Historians are constantly revising their understanding. But even more, different leaders, different citizens, all reacting to different circumstances, will forge different outcomes, even if these outcomes rhyme with past events, as Ken Burns emphasized. Second, even if we were to somehow remember the past with scientific precision, still, it would give us no certainty about the future. The causes of a certain historical event are so complicated that they are impossible to fully unravel. There are no precise precedents that will teach us how to realize or avoid past outcomes. Even the great historical actors themselves might not have fully comprehended why they took this decision and not another. And in any case, as Ken described, 
Their motivations were likely complicated and varied. Third, and perhaps most important of all, since tomorrow hasn't happened yet, since history is the account of all the possibilities of human nature, it is in our power to change the outcome of what might be. This, I think, is what Ken was trying to convey most of all, and perhaps his driving motivation to make the Holocaust documentary. When we swear never again, what we really mean is we know the kinds of things that may happen because they already happened, and we commit to forging a different outcome. Never again is the recognition that, yes, it can happen here. It, hatred of Jews, genocide, mass delusion, can happen anywhere there are human beings. We know that because it happened before. If people have done something once, by definition, they can do it again. Perhaps not in the precise way, but if what was assumed to be the most cultured nation in Europe could perpetrate genocide, that is ipso facto proof that it is within the realm of human possibility. And if all the nations of the Western world could stand aside knowing what was happening and not do all they could to alleviate suffering and to spare the lives of millions of innocents, that, too, is proof that it could happen again. Edmund Burke, commenting on the French Revolution, wrote, History consists of the miseries brought upon the world by pride, ambition, avarice, revenge, lust, sedition, hypocrisy, ungoverned zeal, all the train of disorderly appetites which shake the public. These vices are the cause of the storm. Burke was right, but history is not only the history of human vices. It is also the struggle to bring out the better angels of our nature, to climb out of the swamp. All of us have inside of us the capacity to accept and inflict on others cruelty, oppression, subjugation, persecution, violence, and exploitation. Science and history have proven this over and over again. But we are also, as Shakespeare wrote, the beauty of the world, the paragon of animals, noble in reason, infinite in faculties, in form and moving how express and admirable, in station how like an angel, in apprehension how like a god. Never again means knowing what kinds of outcomes can happen again and again and again if we neglect our responsibility to prevent what Ken called othering others. King David wrote in the Psalms, my heart is steadfast, O God, my heart is firm. Awake, O my soul, awake, and I will awaken the dawn. Knowing all the tragic possibilities and outcomes human beings can inflict on one another, and knowing that good also resides in the human heart, never again means to awaken the dawn, to help bring about a new day when all shall sit under vine and fig tree, and none shall be afraid. Until next time, this is In These Times.